there's this girl that suddenly materialized with her arm in a sling and she's got like a rolled up bit of brown paper and she's going up to random people as they walk past the juice stand and saying, uh, I've been searching the seven seas for the best juice and I found it at this juice stand. The fuck? But then just to really make it weird, the juice stand starts playing music and it's the music to Hydrocity Zone from Sonic 3. What? No. What the fuck? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Doctor Who Reviews, aka it's another Bully General Election Edition. Yay. I mean, we're finally gonna get rid of the of the of the government that we've had for the past checks notes 14 years, seriously. Good God. Um, and that's good. And replacing them with a government that won't do anything better, but perhaps even do some things a little bit worse, which is bad. Hey, Rain. As an American, I'm extremely jealous of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it could be worse for us. We, we've had uh, our uh, hilarious news stories about the Libertarian Party booing every single Trump supporter that's tried showing up, including Trump himself. To the point where it looks like Trump was almost about to cry on stage. Yeah, Trump, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Trump got a good roast off. But mm. that still doesn't mean he's, he's too supposed to be next to president, president of the United oh, States. No, he, but he, he he almost cried on stage. He was like, "Yeah, so I'll vote for President Trump," and then he got booed. And he was like, oh, "Oh, you guys don't like me." Look, we're we're gonna move away from the Trump talk because he genuinely makes me sick. Uh, let's just put it at he was on Epstein's island a lot. Yeah, a stupid amount. And that's let's, really let's move away. Frankly, we do have a, we do have a politician to hate from the actual episode, so uh, we'll get to him later on. But um, Bowen, Bowen, I heard Trump is a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> I like how we, I said, you know, we're moving away from the Trump talk, because she was like, Trump talk, don't mind if I do. Uh, anyway, who's on your virtual left? I'm glad you asked me that. Firstly, to my virtual left, we must stay 73 yards behind him at all times. It's freezing inferno. Oh, why is that? Is that the range of a mirror or something? No. That's the range that you'll actually be able to be heard on this podcast. Is that a fact? At least 73 yards, yeah. That's a fact. To my virtual right, but not politically. She'll tell you a story about the Joker and the Thief of the Night. It's Cockup Usurper, better known as Cat. Honestly, I'd rather stay around until the world falls down. You know, just as the world falls down and said. I feel like I should get that reference, but... I am so disappointed in you. How do you not know your Bowie? Oh my god. Okay, so just to let you all know, I'm a huge Bowie fan, and I didn't catch that because I'm an idiot. And uh, my head will be hung in shame for the entirety of the rest of the ball. podcast. Rain is freaking out in the Moon Age daydream right now. Oh my god. <laughs> Maybe we should just call Major Tom. Hmm? Uh, ashes do ashes. Right, so. <laughs> I even picked the one that's fave related. Good grief. I know, I know, I know. We, you didn't pick the laughing gnome, so zero out of ten. Now he doesn't know about the Bowie. Ah. Actually, I was eating some chips, so fuck you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm choosing to still take this as a minor victory. And finally, <laughs> God damn it. And finally, take a look inside his poetry glass. It's Kachiri. I have poetry? What? That's not what a poetry glass is. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh. So, 73 Yards, Russell T. Davis, before this episode aired, said that this was unlike any episode of Doctor Who that had ever been before. No, she sure. wasn't wrong. <laughs> to, to call boom divisive is doing it a disservice. This is the most divisive thing I think we're going to have all series. Like a legitimate divisive. And not... now you're mirroring Frez. 
not like, you know, hey, I hate the fact that they're not whites and stuff. And, you know, we're pro trans now devices. This is uh, a legit device. Just, just to interrupt, credit to doc, at Doctor Who Moment on Twitter.com, X.com, whatever the fuck Elon's calling it these days for this meme. But, wow, it's a good meme. But with that said, continue. Wait, I, I have a question. Since when is uh, being for trans divisive? Oh, when you're an idiot. <laughs> you, uh, you'd be surprised. Trans rights, trans rights baby. Yes. If, if you follow this podcast and not realize we all believe in trans rights, get out. I mean, I, I mean, mean, for, I mean, for the love of God, Rain. It was losing you. Rain puts down whatever image you got up, so when Kachiri's talking, you can see that his icon is literally him holding a giant pride trans flag heart. Yeah, that's no. That's to be even nerdier than that. It's a heart container from Zelda filled with pride. There you if, go. Even better. But if 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 people do not think that we support trans rights, I just refer you to the uh, the podcast we did for the Devil's Court. Where our special guest was literally trans. Hell yeah. I also invite you to please comment down below what you think so we can block your ass. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this this has divided opinion like nobody's business. I, I want to apologize to Stephen Moffat for calling Boom divisive because of the whole faith thing. I mean, RTD was just like, oh, you're being divisive with that. Hold my beer. Uh, this was the. This came before Doom was being filmed. This, uh, not Doom. Boom. Wow. Doom. Doom. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a Monday. <laughs> it's just what I need to make them all bleed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this was actually the first episode they filmed. Um, Gatwa was still uh, finishing off sex education, which is why this is a Dr. Light story. This is, you know, the biggest question that has gotten a lot of people to dislike this episode is, why have I done a Dr. Light story this early on? But it's because this was the very first episode they filmed, and the only way they could film this was to make it a Dr. Light. Brez, what's up? I just want to add, the fact that this is the first episode they filmed... <laughs> Millie Gibson, holy shit. It's like, okay, you're the new Doctor Who companion. Well, here's your first story. Oh, is it a typical adventure? Uh, no. Oh, is it something a little wilder? Uh, no, here it is. It's the craziest fucking Doctor Who episode we've ever done. That's your first... That's, welcome to day one on the job. This, she this script, it. she absolutely nails that. This is an amazing performance. Whatever you think of the, you know, the lack of answers and the divisive nature of the script... Mary Gibson, incredible performance. I, I'm just gonna signpost it. I'm on team masterpiece. This, yeah, yeah. This is this is absolutely fucking incredible, Doctor Who. Unlike anything the show has done before, and I kind of love it for that. No, this is going to be. Imagine. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, you. No, no, you. No, you. No, you. No, you. No, you. I can't believe the that moment. Wow. You're like a couple Canadians arguing. No, after you. Oh, no, after you. I was going to say, this is going to be probably, of this era, the most talked about episode for decades to come. This is the blink. This is the turn left. This is the, you know. I, I mean, the finale is still to come. But yeah. It's still to come. But, of, True. you know, you're going to be seeing, like, who culture lists or fan lists of, like, the top ten episodes from you know disney seasons one through 12 and you know you know 6675 centimeters will be in there um top 10 <laughs> most experimental episodes and it'll be high on the list i mean it's it's i unless i'm thinking wildly the last really like experimentalist episode we had that fucked with shit was a cat's beloved sleep no more yes i love it which you're here now, uh, and you can say that it was based and good. It was so good. It's like, say what you want about, you know, it being a snot-based monster, technically, but I Burger Sandman that comes in, you know, like, the whole found footage aspect, it's fucking awesome. 
But also, all, all I can imagine is uh, RTD like going into the room, meeting Millie Gibson for the first time, and being like, okay, um, so obviously uh, Gatwa isn't available for this, uh, so you are going to have to carry this episode a little bit. Do you think you can handle it? And she takes one look at the script, it's like, I got it. I just want to add, uh, I know, Rain, you got your hand raised, but I'll be quick. Uh, like Sleep No More, this episode also is one that doesn't explain everything and is sure to leave a lot of people going, but but they got to follow up on it. They got to. Never follow never, up on this. And they never followed up with a, the, you know, oh, I've beamed the signal in your brain that makes you turn into dust and die. Oh, how are they going to follow up on that? They got to. They got to explain it. No, they don't got to. Rain? Uh, yeah, I was I was just going to add that much like um, Sleep No More, which is an underrated episode, by the way. I'm just putting it out there. It is. Very underrated uh, episode. Um, no traditional title sequence for 73 yards. Yep. We just go straight into it. And that right away makes you sit up and go, oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, we're doing something. Here. Okay, that was something to the unsettling part of it. Oh, yeah. The whole I thing's mean, unsettling. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I've gotten into actual arguments over the last weekend about how unsettling it is. And the worst uh, response was, oh, the only reason why they did that was to, because the episode ran long, it couldn't have fit on BBC One. Like, guys, <laughs> BBC One will have start times at like 10.37 or 10.42, and there's been episodes of Doctor Who in the past that went like 52 minutes. They yeah. Not even that. <laughs> it's not even that. BBC owns the thing. They own Doctor Who. They can do whatever the fuck they want with the, the airing time. The giggle was the reason, seconds. but yes. <laughs> but yeah, no. I mean, the, the, sorry, go the ahead. reason why the intro wasn't there was to let you know how unsettling this episode is. Yes. It is unsettling. It's meant to make you unsettled. And if you somehow get settled at any point during it, the episode did not work for you the way that RTD wanted it to, which is fine. You can still enjoy it. It's like watching a horror movie and not getting jump scared or scared at any of the stuff. You know, you are meant to be uncomfortable. The camera shots where you are basically looking up Millie or Kate's noses, uncomfortable. You're way too close to them. While at the same time, you know... 0.04 miles away is this creepy woman you cannot even see, which is also in cell. Yeah. Um, I will just say about Millie Gibson's performance here, other than the obligatory, give her the bath the right the hell now yeah. talk. She she won't get it, but she will at least hope to get nominated for it. But we'll we'll find out. I'm sure she won't she won't get nominated for it. It doesn't work like that, certainly. Um I think that however long or short her time on Doctor Who is, I hope she has a long and bright career as an actress because her range in this episode is fantastic. God. She portrays so many different emotions at different times of her life, all with this underlying loneliness and sadness to it. And God, it's just such a good performance. People's been abandoning her for 65 years, but she has never felt alone. Oh, that broke my heart. Oh. Oh, that bit broke my heart at the end. But um, Before we get too much farther, can we just lay out the general synopsis of this episode? Because I feel like, yeah, we're not doing this in like order, but we always forget to just say what the episode's about. I mean, I, mean, I mean, hope that people have watched this episode. Yeah, if you've not watched here, it I'll... and you're reviewing this, stop it, watch it, come back. Seriously, yeah. you know what? I can condense this down. Ruby gets chased by an old woman for 45 minutes. Essentially. For five years. Chased. I can right. condense this down even, even further into one sentence. The Fae. Don't mess with the Fae. Yeah, just don't mess with the Fae. If it's the Fae that's responsible for it, even, we don't know. It's the Fae. Don't mess with the Fae. Well, see, that's I mean, my theory on this. That's But the thing is, I... I think the doctor knew what was about to happen to start this episode. That's been my other theory that goes on. That's I don't been going think on he about knew. This episode. Like, it's weird how he just randomly, right before disappearing, gives Ruby the hint about Mad Jack. I mean, he's not. He mentions, he, he mentions Rush Rap Gwillem. 
that that name will we'll, from this point on oh, these yeah, names, Welsh names yes yeah <laughs> um so like randomly the doctor says oh hey you know the the worst Welsh stuff to live is this Roger guy from you know your immediate future you know hey he was just a piece of work oh crap I stepped on something for three the third episode in four episodes um, Imagine or every time that an episode of Doctor Who began, we should have got was stepping on something that really gave him a bad time later on. I'd have two nickels. But let's not also forget the fire <laughs> from episode one. I, didn't, didn't Millie step on that, though? The, yeah, still, did. someone met, stepping on it. And then I love the theory that uh, you could count the, when the doctor messed up on the piano. That was a misstep. Oh, the piano. oh. oh God. Cat, save me from this embarrassment. No, uh, I won't. Uh, but also, I'm going to disagree because this is just what the doctor does. The doctor loves to give little random tidbits about the places that he takes his companions to. It's like, did we need to know that he had a relationship with Elizabeth? No, but he still kept talking about how he had relationships with Queen Elizabeth and all these other people. This is what he does. He spews out random facts about the place. Yeah. To, to go with that point, in, in an episode that we may or may not get to visit in the not too distant future, uh, the doctor pauses from uh, figuring out how they're going to survive an alien threat to talk about the uh, last person to uh, inhabit 10 down straight before it became the politician central, Mr. Chicken. Yeah. He has absolutely nothing to do with the plot. He just mentions that like a little history lesson. Yeah. So it's like, obviously, it's the beginning of the episode and he's going to have something, you know, relevant to say to the episode. But that doesn't mean that he knew that what it was going to happen. I don't think he did. No, oh, he so, does see he, he does see possible timelines. I mean, that, possible that's, timelines. However, this is the Fey. Yeah, I, I. The whole thing about this episode is no explanations are actually given, other than who the old woman is at the end. That explanation is given in terms of who it actually is. The thing who it is, was the entire time. Do we know that that's an explanation? Yeah. No, no, no. Do we though? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the thing about this. That there is no concrete explanation. Yeah, it's like we never see the woman's face. Even when she's coming towards Ruby at the end, she still has her back to Ruby the entire time. So we don't know that that's actually supposed to be Ruby. It could be... Like, I have a whole theory going on. Um, is it all right if I go ahead and go into it? Oh, yeah. Sure. So my theory is that everything that happens in this episode is entirely the fae so the doctor steps on the fairy circle and he breaks it so his punishment is he's just gone that's his punishment he broke something he's gone the fae are tricksters this is the type of thing that they do um ruby on the other hand her biggest crime is she picks up the scrolls and she starts reading them and especially she starts reading about mad jack um and so my theory is that if we want an explanation for this episode, which we really don't, I think it's entirely the Fae punishing Ruby for daring to touch their things. So they give her her greatest fear, which is the fear of being constantly abandoned for seemingly no reason. And so they have all these people who come up to the old woman, they take a look at Ruby, and then they immediately run and just abandon her to her fate. Even her own adoptive mother does this to her. And so at the end, the Fae are like, okay, we've done enough, you've been punished enough, we're going to put you in the place of this woman so that now you can warn your past self to stop fucking our shit. You have a surprising ally in that theory. Oh? Russell T. Davis himself. <laughs> <laughs> he gave an interview to the Radio Times, and while he would not give all the answers, he absolutely mentions um, the Fae, or the ancient folk, which is the same thing. And this idea that something has been transgressed, some great crime has taken place, and there must be a penance paid, and Ruby's the one to pay it. That's what I think it was. I think in the entire episode is her paying the price for the crime that she committed. Which is unfair, because the one that, that, that commits the crime is the Doctor! Well, no, Ruby is the one who picks up the scrolls and starts reading their, stru their stuff. Well, my theory is that's part of the, of the punishment. They both the fairies wanted to read that to, to start set it in motion. 
Because you have to remember, if you step into a fairy circle, you disappear. That's just what happens. Technically, the doctor broke and stepped into a fairy circle, so he disappears. It's a really good way to get him out of the narrative, isn't it? Mm. And, the, and the really yeah. interesting thing is that in turn left, when the doctor disappears by, you know, dying and being disappeared in that sense, they, and again, it's a Russell T. Davies episode that he wrote it, didn't, didn't he write turn left? I think he did. I mean, it was the start I, of the series four, four, three part finale. I think he so. did, yeah. So, yeah, he he um, wrote it. Yeah. So, in that story, the Doctor dies and the world goes to hell. Just completely goes to hell, and is only fixed when Donna sacrifices her alternate self to get her past self to turn left, not right. In this alternate timeline, if that's even what is going on here. The Doctor's gone, and there are no big alien incursions. There's no huge consequences other than for Ruby herself. Well, I'll let Fresno go first, but... All I was going to say was, hey, turn left. Isn't that the story with a very different circle? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably going to make me sound terrible, but I've never actually seen Turn Left. W weren't you on the podcast? We didn't do a Turn Left podcast, did we? No, we haven't we done did. Turn Left, I don't think. I swear we did a Turn Left podcast. I, I, guess did. I don't think I was there because I do not remember Turn Left at all. I yeah. will look into that. Meanwhile, Kachiri has a point to make. Okay, uh, I was going to say, uh, Kate pointed out that, uh, yeah, no, there's that, all that stuff going on. And uh, basically, the former companions are saving the day by the skin of their teeth. So it, it's addressed. Okay, on, on my master list, we haven't got turned left as one that we've done. I think uh -huh. I must have been thinking of a bit where you were gone and you were like, oh, I'm trapped in the turn left circle of bears. Oh. I don't think I did that <laughs> either, but. You did so do that. Okay, so now. Now I'm the one that's experiencing dissonance. Great. Uh, experiencing semper distance. Oh. So that pub scene, now that we're talking about it. I said dissonance, not di Well played. Um, Just go along yeah, with it. So, wild thing about this whole pub scene, one of the actors in this is somebody who has, should have been in Doctor Who a long, long time ago, in my opinion. Brilliant, brilliant actress. Sean oh. Phillips. Sean Phillips is possibly best known for playing the character of Livia in I, Claudius. If you've got 12 hours spare, please watch I, Claudius. It is amazing. Awesome. I, I, I'm not going to do the, the line because I don't want to break the, the microphone, oh, wow. but Brian Blessed. That's like two and a half seasons of Sumfigure right there. Bre I've watched that to the end. You have no power over move that anymore. Hey, hey, Rain, how about that quantum leap? I read your <laughs> book, you magnificent bastard. <laughs> my, hey, that, that, that's Mike pushing the quantum leap. I mean, it'd be nice if you. Oh, were. I know, and I hate him for it. <laughs> yeah, well, I hate him for a different thing. No, I, I, I love you, Mike. Love Hate's you. a strong word. But also, <laughs> I am not playing that SNES game. No. What SNES game was that? You know, good damn well. Okay, you were paying attention. Well done. I thought I might catch you out. I thought I might catch you out. She's she's been in um in Big Finish, numerous Big Finish roles has uh has Sean Phillips, but not Doctor Who until now. Actually, she's she has kind been of wasted a little bit. Doctor Who audio. Yeah, she's she's kind of wasted a little bit, but also she plays her role to perfection. I mean, the entire point of this is a, a subversion of sorts. Like, you think you're getting a Welsh folk horror episode where, oh, you've disrupted the circle. Now the ancient pagan powers are going to get you for your transgressions, which is kind of what happens according to Cat's theory. But it's, it's what I'm saying is that the episode seems to be making you assume that it's going to be a more traditional folk horror thing where it's like, oh, this clearly defined creature is coming for you. And then it turns out they're all just fucking with her. It's a, yeah, it's a guy delivering crabs to the pub. And, and I mean, even before that, they start fucking with her. Can I pay with my phone and all that? Yeah, yeah. 
They they like, even accused her of being racist. My my roommate during that scene was like, "Oh wait, is she like in the eighties? I'm like, "You didn't see the other guy with his phone out or the TV on the wall?" <laughs> I thought the twist was gonna be at first when. You're supposed to think, oh, it's 2024 uh, Wales, and actually, it's 2046 Wales, and we're in the age of Roger at Gwillem. <laughs> but well, that we wasn't what we got. Oh, well, we'll get there soon enough. We got something. We got something far crazier than that. But uh, yeah, th this whole thing is again, it's some the expectations. That seems to be a theme. This series. You think you're getting worse, worse folk horror? I'm, no, you don't. I'm, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. Wow, subverting expectations. Did Ryan Johnson work on this Doctor Who? <laughs> nice out three. Let's go, baby. Yeah. Uh, Woo. Uh, Set I now want a Ryan Johnson directed episode of Doctor Who. So. Oh my now. God! Yes. Oh, that would that would slit. That would that would that would that would fuck. That that would be like probably the best like Christmas special ever. Like, sorry, the Doctor Who's Ben Blanc. Sign me up. Oh, get Daniel Craig on there too. Makes no damn sense. He, he, he is. Though. He is Benoit Blanc. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Th that quote does perfectly fit 70 of the arts. Makes no damn sense. Compels me, though. Absolutely. Well, well, I, I've made sense of it in my own way, but we'll get to that. I I, I didn't, and then I watched it again, and I did, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that a bit later on, if that's okay. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'm, I have I'm to build up my, to it. But, um, I'm saving my shot for later, too. Yeah, I, I will say right now, I've been to Wales several times. I, a particular little place called Landod now, town called Landod now. I love it there. I have very fond memories of being with my family there. The Welsh people are great as a whole. If you're only experienced the Welsh people with these people in this pub, you'd think they were absolute bastards. <laughs> because these people in the pub are absolute bastards. Particularly the yeah, person that, that, that runs the, the, the pub because she kicks Ruby out for no reason. No, it's the good reason that she's a bitch. No, the good reason is that her friend, who is a uh, you know a, a, a staple know. of the whole pub area, has stopped coming over and blames right. Ruby for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that ties in with the whole abandonment issues thing. Mm hmm. And, and people turning on her wherever she goes because of the of the, uh, of the woman. But um, it, sounds like, uh, it sounds like my theory has some credibility. And I think somebody else's theory might have some credibility because Kachiri has a theory about the spooky ghost woman, and I'd like to give him the time to talk about that now. Kachiri got a theory. That's, that's uh, awesome. hi, out. Kachiri oh, theory. Oh, um, but yeah. <laughs> I think... How dare you stand where he stood? <laughs> oh my god! You didn't even give Undertale to the Pope. Come on. Oh my okay. god! <laughs> okay, continue. I think the old woman that's always 0.036 nautical miles away from Ruby all the time... Oh, Jesus is Christ. ...is the personification of death. She is always there. People don't want to pay attention to it. People will avoid it without realizing. And if you try to face it face to face, you it triggers a flight or flight response. You ever run into what you think might be a poisonous spider or a dangerous animal in the woods? You will run. You will be afraid. You'll be scared. And the fact that's always there, and it's the thing that finally comes to Ruby at the very end of the episode to, you know, kill her, to send her back to, you know. The start of the episode. What's up, Press? Oh, I, I was just gonna because I think this is the time I'm gonna shoot my shot. So, do you got anything else about your theory before I? No, it's just basically she's always there, and if you get closer, it triggers a flight or flight. I mean, it's possible that you know whenever they were listening to her, they saw their own deaths, and they they attributed their own deaths to Ruby, which is why they uh, started treating Ruby with disgust because it was something that's not psychic. It's not something that's like normal supernatural because, you know, apparently uh, units not equipped with all of that. And yeah. So this is what I really love about this episode is the way that because it's so uh, ambiguous and uh, non-explanatory, you can read basically whatever reflects back to you 
from it. So for instance, you can see that the woman is death and you have your uh, reasons and uh, ways that you vibe with that. And I see it as a uh, Ruby's greatest fear, being abandoned, being an adoptee who was uh, abandoned as a child, a foundling or whatever they call it in the church on Ruby Road. And that fear being made manifest as everyone who encounters a woman just abandons Ruby with disdain and disgust. Even her own adopted mother turns on a dime in one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the entire thing, changes the locks, gets an injunction against her, tells her, even your birth mother didn't want you. Leave me alone. And Kate Stewart in the scene, will, I'm sure we'll be talking, just the cold way that she, when she gets affected by it, she just says, disengage, just... So that's what it is for me. It's Ruby's fears of abandonment and the loneliness that comes from that. And I just want to make the greater point that this is a, what I call vibes-based storytelling, or what I've referred to. It reminds me a lot of a, the works of David Lynch. Now, it's not entirely Lynchian. Lynch is operating on this entire different axis and uh, thematic structure. But there is a resemblance in the sense that weird supernatural shit is happening. They're not going to explain it to you. So what do you think is going on? And what you think is going on is a reflection of the vibes you get from the episode and a reflection of your own internal landscape. And it's really kind of great when you can analyze media from that perspective. It's, it's a nice lens of looking at things. It can turn otherwise incomprehensible pieces of nonsense into these brilliant resonant pieces that stick with you, as I think 73 Yards is going to stick with me, much like uh, some of the uh, David Lynch content that's out there of all time. And uh, that's basically my feeling of how I read the episode, and it really shines when you do it like that. So, uh, Rain, what you got? Okay, so I agree with your take that it's about Ruby's abandonment issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I'd like to just talk about why the 73 yards, not in the sense of the, of the in the in universe, because that's not explained, it shouldn't be explained, but yeah. Rusty Davis in that same Radio Times interview, why he came up with the idea for 73 yards. Mm-hmm. And he literally did it. He went to a pier, I think, in Wales, and he basically noticed the woman in the, in the distance, and he gauged the distance where he could see the woman but not her face. Hmm. So you can see someone's there, but you can't see who it is. And that's the significance of, 70, of the 73 yards itself. Beautiful. And that's I will also say, with regard to your point with David Lynch, I used to think, until very recently actually, that that whole, you know, what do you think thing was a giant cop-out. Well, I, you, I, you said as much when we when I uh, brought this up in our chat. This is like, oh, in my opinion, that's a massive cop out. Yeah, I, I thought it was a massive cop out, and then I watched it again. I thought you might have a point. Yes, um, because I'm a believer that not everything has to be explained, mm-hmm. but that something has to be explained. You can't just have nothing there. But when I watched it again, I did notice that I actually missed a couple of crucial bits of information, probably because I was just freaking out, like, what the hell is this I'm watching on the screen right now? <laughs> so the information was there. The thing about fairies was there. The thing about Mad Jack being released into the world was there. So that was there. That was actually on me, not on the episode. Fair enough. And when we get something as good as this, or as you know, thought-provoking as this, as long as we don't get it every single week, because then it really would get too much. Um, I think having a, a story where you have to make up your own conclusion isn't the worst thing in the world. Okay. Well, first of all, the duality of reactions. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Just... <laughs> I, I love it. Wait, I... One one tweeter, I don't understand. They didn't explain shit. The other tweeter, I love that they didn't explain shit. Uh, secondly, I just want to mention a uh, Twitter thread, which, uh, Rain, hopefully you can link uh, down below, by uh, Max, and I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong, Max, Max Kashevsky, 
and it's a, a thread about 73 yards and it goes into a lot of what i find in the episode you know about the abandonment about the other symbolism and it's a really good it's a really good thread and you should read it if you are able to and have not told anyone to uh, do something untoward with a cactus not undeservedly oh was that my cue oh <laughs> no 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 i was talking to the other person who's told someone to do something with a cactus not undeservedly cactus man what are you doing here Oh, who are they? I should probably follow them. Anyway, oh. <laughs> uh, so I, again, back to my thing. Again, we all have different takes on this episode. I don't think they released Mad Jack. I think that was the sh random story they were saying at the pub to get Ruby riled up. And then Ruby thought that, oh, hey, if I stop Mad Jack, you know, maybe this whole thing will end. And the, the ghost woman will go away, which, no, that didn't happen. So I don't think Mad Jack was actually released. I think it was just all coincidence. I think that was part of all the coincidence with her. And I know uh, Frez raised the hand first, but I think Cass should say something. She hasn't said anything in bed. That's true. I just wanted to say that I agree with you and that the Mad Jack thing was a coincidence. So please, Cat. I don't think it was a coincidence. Boom. Suck it. Um... <laughs> So going back to my theory about the Fae, I think that Mad Jack was on purpose because, I mean, look at Roger's name. Where do you get Jack from Roger? You got some nice. Tell me that. Well, yes, obviously. You ask him nicely? Um, but he's also the head of the Albion party, you know, like the kingdom yeah. of Albion. Yeah. Fairy. I was, I was so my, that. Honestly, what I think is that, again, it goes back to the Fae. The Fae you know, made it so that she saw the name Mad Jack. Um, you know, obviously they tried to freak her out in the pub and everything, but I think that specifically Roger was named Mad Jack so that Ruby would, you know, have to deal with it and, you know, figure that out and stuff. And essentially, I think that was all part of the plot of the Fae. So I don't think it was a red herring or anything. I think it was placed there on purpose. I, I didn't catch the Albion thing, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, he's part of the Albion party. I, I just wanted... Like, I, I, knew, I, I mentioned... I, I caught the mention of the Albion party, but it didn't connect that with the Fae, but that's actually right, and that's brilliant. So well done. Um, I just want to mention at this point, because there might not be a better place to put it in, we're just mentioning the Fae and the Fairies. I know that none of, none of you have watched the first series of Torchwood in full. No. <laughs> no. But there is a story in the first series of Torchwood called Small Worlds. And it's about fairies. Uh. And these fairies are not the, like, happy-go-lucky, go-in-the-dark, uh, cute creatures that we're always used to. Now, these things are evil monsters. Did Chip not do this one? Oh, God. I will have to look that up when I've got a spare moment. But um, Fucking, I'll do it for you. Hang on. The, the, the point is this. Small worlds is about something, you know, an idea that's, that's like, nice and fluffy and light. And it turns... And it becomes so nasty and so evil. And that's this episode as well. So, Rank, two things. Yeah. One, uh, Peter J. Hammond wrote this episode, Small Worlds. Two, I am now, Google Image Search is now showing me the image of the fairies. And I am sending you the bill for my sleeping pills tonight. Yeah, you, you need an adult after saying that. <laughs> I did say they're evil creatures. It, it's a good episode, but it's a very uncomfortable episode for reasons I can't get into. I will say that you should not watch it last thing at night before you go to bed. It's four in the day. I'm oh, unsettled by looking at that fucking thing. It's, <laughs> that's the, believe me, that's not the most unsettling thing about the episode. Oh, boy. There are at least two things worse than that. Oh, boy. Both of what them involve a small that? child. What a fun show Torchwood was, huh? No, it, was to be, it was meant to be the adult version of Doctor Who for a reason. My God, this one is... Right, yeah. Remind me to never ever watch that episode if it involves bad things happening to small children. Um, bad is a relative term. It's more like the, the oh, child causes the bad things to happen to other people. Yeah, don't ever. Look oh, okay, up that's fine. Then. That's fine. Don't ever look up Children of Earth. Oh my God, no! I haven't recovered from that. Neither the, the one where nobody can have kids. 
No, that's Miracle Day. What? No, Miracle Day, no one can, can die, sorry. Uh, children of Earth is when the children of Earth get possessed. Oh, I've never heard of that. It gets so dark. Alrighty. Don't look into it. Just trust us. <laughs> yeah, just... It's, it's been, like, what? 2009, it's been what? It's been 15 years since I saw Children of Earth and I still haven't got over it. It's that dark. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think... I, I think the whole faith thing not being explicitly mentioned as the reason behind it, but I think it is the reason behind it. I'm, I'm going to count on this one. Yay! <laughs> oh, look, Wayne, 15 years after watching Children of Earth. Yes, actually. I thought it was your reaction to, to Cat being right. I was like, that's a bit unfair. <laughs> no, cat, no, Cat's right all the time. Damn straight. You heard it here first. It's official. It's like, I, I do agree with what Fred said earlier that you can have your own interpretation. It's just, this is the one that makes the most sense to me is that this is the face punishment to Ruby for her and the doctor messing up their fairy circle. It's just the doctor did way more to mess it up than Ruby did. I think so you should Ruby be encouraged the... to come up with your, with your own idea. But yeah, yes. so, so Ruby gets the quote unquote lighter punishment. <laughs> so but this like is the Fae, so this is what I would do. also fit in with what I know of the of the Fae mm -hmm. because um as far as I'm concerned, the one that transgressed transgressed was the doctor, but it's Ruby yeah. that gets the bigger punishment. I, I will but, say what's well, unfair, though. the doctor just gets fucking disappeared. Mm. That's pretty yeah, and then comes back. I, I will say there's there's two things. Like one, I saw some critique that said that they should have had the doctor run to the TARDIS and lock it from the inside because of the whole oh my god, I've got to abandon Ruby curse, which no. one, one would be way too cruel, and two would give the game away early because you don't know until Plus, having Carla him just goes gone. Up. Having him just gone like that is fucking amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then at the end, when the when the tide is still there on that cliffside after all these years, and it's like got moss growing on it, oh! Hey, it's like what David Tennant was saying in the specials. What was he saying in the specials? Yeah, you know, he said I, I think it was Wild Blue Yonder where he said, "Oh, the TARDIS is gone, but it'll be on some cliff, and people will worship as an object, and it'll just quietly fade away." Uh, secondly, I wanted to say that along these other diverse takes of what uh, the curse could be: abandonment, death. And that shit. I saw another YouTube video that basically said at first they thought it was about uh, being queer and the fear of coming out and being rejected. Which um, that's a bit of a stretch for me. Well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I'm just like all interpretations are valid if you can uh, justify them well enough. They are, but for me personally, that's a bit of a stretch. Whatever. I'm not the person. Except for yours. Your interpretation sucked. I'm not saying that their interpretation <laughs> is, is not valid. I'm saying that personally for me, that's not an interpretation that I can get behind. I could be convinced. But, uh, but the, person, the person is perfectly right to come up with that theory. For the fifth time, I'm trying to leave Kat in because she's had her hand up <laughs> and you two keep talking over her. <laughs> well, I just wanted to point out something that I realized... Um, so I always have Tartar's Wiki open just so that I could see the synopsis and plot and everything. And it IP pointed something yet? out to me. What? You haven't been IP banned yet? <laughs> no. Well, to be fair, I only did the edit once. For all I know, I just can't edit anything. Um, but I'm looking at this, and in the beginning, when she and the Doctor are walking out of the TARDIS and they're talking, Ruby says that she has been in Wales twice before, once for a band and once for a boy. At the end of the episode, after old Ruby turns into the lady and comes back to tell them not to step on it, Ruby says she's been there three times before, but can't name the third time. Oh, shit. I, no, I, she I says remember. at the very end of the episode before it goes to credit, I guess now. Yeah, so she, she knows for a fact she's been here three times, but she doesn't realize what the third time was, and her mind sort of fills in the blank for her and tells her it's, it's now. But we know that she has been there before. So it, it kind of feels like almost some sort of timey-wimey type stuff that's going on here. Oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced the doctor saw the old woman. I'm convinced I don't think that's it. Knew. Because this is all Ruby. This is a Ruby-centric episode. This is not about the doctor in any way, the, shape, the, or form. So in my knows, opinion... 
the doctor knows when the time's been messed with. Yeah, but he doesn't know now. But Ruby remembers. Some part of Ruby remembers. Her actual mind doesn't remember, but some part of Ruby remembers that she has been here and she had to go through all of this stuff. So that's why I think that this is a punishment. It's so that, you know, uh, the Fae is like, okay, Ruby, you're going to remember this, but you're not going to actually remember this. And that's like 100% Fae shit right there. Wibbly wobbly, Fae wavy. Yes. Fae shit. Speaking of stretches, that. <laughs> don't fuck with the Fae. Just don't fuck with the Fae. I mean, I, I completely accept that explanation. What Catcher said then about the Fae? <laughs> the, and um, also everything else I've said. No, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> Pat, Pat, I know I know you want to run a tabletop RPG one day. And so I'm gonna be wary. You're gonna be like, you're coming to a you come into a secluded clearing and you see a fairy there. I run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not the fairies you'll have to worry about. It's the ponies, I know. You see a no, fairy, roll for, roll, you, you see a fairy in the clearing, roll for shitting your pants. Not even that. Just be wary of a man named Alex. Okay. I mean, have you seen a clockwork orange? Yes. Not that kind of Alex. Gotcha. One set of scenes I thought was really quite striking and goes in hand in hand with this whole the whole point of the episode is that Ruby is pushing everyone away from her. Are the scenes where she's dating? Love these going oh, through gosh. the years, and people immediately going, That's not a 40 year old woman, that's not the put. Firstly, right, firstly, there are people out there who have what are called baby faces, they look younger than they actually are. I should know because people have told me that I have one of them. People think I'm about what eight years younger than I actually am. A blessing. It is, particularly as you get older, because you somehow look more like the age you look somehow looks like more young as you get older. It's 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 very strange. But um, and I actually think that the the makeup on her to make her look older look great. I mean, they basically just pull the Clark Kent on her, you know. Give her the glasses. This is perfect. It's it's a look that suits her. It works, yeah. <clears throat> the way she holds a wine glass is iconic. And I, I love going back to your thing that it does fit the uh, punishment if we're going along the Fey route. That uh, Ruby, who uh, is violated by this, this thing and has it following her at a distance, is herself semper distance from other people in life, including romantically. So one thing about that, and I had to go and look this up real quick. Um, the old version of Ruby Sunday is played by one Amanda Walker, but the person who plays the woman is Hillary Hobson. So that's mm -hmm. two different people, and I don't know why they would do that unless they were actually two different people. Or they could be, you know, it could be to play with the ambiguity, you know. like Well, oh, we don't see old Ruby's actor standing, the actress may not be able to stand in the middle of stuff. Or it could be as simple as that. Yeah, I, I think with what you've just said, that sounds very much like a punishment from the Greek gods. He's bringing his Greek in again. The, the, the idea that, yeah, like the, the, the idea that, you know, she can't form relationships she loses her relationships that sounds like a punishment from the greek gods to me i'm not saying the greek gods caused this we're talking about the season I'm just saying, uh, it, finale villain is not omega <laughs> no it's not jason isis either i heard the season twist is omega yeah 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 so what you're trying to say, Rain, is that uh, this episode is essentially Ruby's version of pushing the boulder up the hill. Yeah, actually. Oh, my God. 
I was going to go with Tantalus that he, he, he couldn't say to his, his hunger or his thirst because he every time he reached for the apples that just move out of reach, every time he drank, drank from the river, it would go down. But that's good too. Hmm. But did the water... I would have created more to the boulder because it's her own efforts to try to keep relationships and yet she keeps failing at them. That's very deep. Also, Christopher Smith been brought up. He was not happy, God damn it. I mean his apples and waters were 0.66 kilometers away. Oh my god. I can't wait for you to finally get to inches. <laughs> That's coming next, I'm sure. But um <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I will just point this out because Sisyphus got mentioned. Sisyphus was not happy. What are you talking about, woman on TikTok? Yeah. Was it even TikTok? I... Who knows? Wait, unhappy people online? Name a website. What, whatever people, what, whatever website it was, she's wrong. The whole point of the Sisyphus myth is not, oh, he was actually happy to do this. He actually enjoyed this. No, the point is he found it as eternal torture because it was an eternal torture. He sinned against the gods. This is his punishment. Oh, he took a rest? That's just quiet quitting. <laughs> That's a really good joke. Thank you. Thank you. You know, while, while rain is slowly breaking, I just thought of this. Um, I pointed out how there were two different actresses. You said that maybe the one who played old Ruby couldn't do it. Well, then why didn't they just have Hillary Hobson do both? Um, I don't know how old Hillary Hobson is. Maybe it's a younger woman in a wig. You never know. I mean, you know, when the actor for Arto transformed to zero one, that wasn't him in the suit. Why couldn't they just have the person in the suit play Arto? Maybe it was a woman in a wig, or maybe it was Agatha all along. Who knows? Uh, maybe it was Doc. I think, um... I think I just need to watch the Doctor Who Unleashed for this and see if they have they give a reason for there being two actresses or something. I I can't remember if they did Unleashed or not. To be honest, this has been a weekend. This weekend's just been a blur. A nice blur, but a blur nonetheless. Yes. But um, the the whole point of the the, the end game of the of the uh, dating scenes is that Ruby sees uh, the TV, and the TV shows an interview. With um, Roger Apgwillam and Amal Rajan, who's a, a legitimate BBC journalist, by the way, and they've aged him up somewhat convincingly. He, he gets credited as himself at the end. So, so the whole Roger. I mean, considering I have no idea what he looks like, I think he looked good. The whole Roger stuff is wild because uh, either if you're going with the Fay theory. Uh, the cat has either it is oh i need to stop this mad jack fellow from doing the bad thing and maybe that'll end my eternal torture oh no it didn't actually but i did a, a yeah. good thing or you know you could be cynical and just oh it's just a whole bunch of bullshit that was put in there to pad the episode what's up I, i'll say this for, for me personally this is where the thing kind of lost a bit in terms of the pacing mm -hmm. i thought the first 13 minutes was phenomenally well paced and then this happened and kind of dragged it down a bit. But having said that, the joke about Ruby going, you know, I, I, I volunteered to, to help um, him get elected and I got a thousand pounds in my bank account. You can have that and I'll do anything. I'll even hold the coat that just cuts to her holding the coats during the debate <laughs> with like the worst, the worst looking face on her. To be fair, that wasn't really a debate, that was an interview. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. But, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about this part online. Uh, particularly uh, Ruby's uh, problematic nature in not shutting down Roger sooner with that lady, Marty, and the fact that he's clearly engaging in an abuse of power involving her. You know, she apologizes to her at the end, but it's like people were saying, oh, you could have stopped it sooner. Oh, but you were complicit. You went inside, you went to try to change the system from the inside, but, you know, you became complicit in the part of it, and you did real harm, and stuff like that. So it's interesting people say that. It's uh, maybe a little too heavy for the episode to have something like that in there. But Well, I'm the thing is, it's also weird because Ruby finally, after what, the, at this point, 15, 16 years, it's like, it's taken me all this time to realize what I'm here to do. She thinks this is her mission, and she doesn't act on it for months. 
It's just kind of weird. What's up, Brian? And Kat? Uh, Kat could go first. Uh, you go ahead, because I want to see if you're going to say the same thing that I'm going to say. All right. So, um, Roger Ap Gwilym, which literally translates to Roger of Wales, by the way. Well, that's what he says anyway. I, I have no... I, I don't know what that much Welsh, so I, I don't know if that's if that's true, if that's just something RTD's made up. But the whole uh, thing William about... William is just he, basically a derivative of the old French version of William. Okay, so he is making it up. Um, he, he just did that to sound better for the Welsh people. That, that makes a lot of sense, actually, for the character. So the thing about Marty, the intern, is that I like the fact that they absolutely let you know that she is being abused without outright stating it. I think that's handled really well, actually, apart from the fact that Ruby could have stopped it sooner. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were going to say, Kat? No, I was going to uh, once again be like, all y'all are fucking stupid. <laughs> Fair enough. Please so we have to remember in the beginning of the episode, the doctor specifically says that Roger brings Great Britain and possibly the entire world to the brink of nuclear war. She feels that this is her job. She's supposed to come in and stop the nuclear war from happening. And it's like, I get it. Whatever Roger did to her, um, her friend, uh, whose name uh, I forget. Marty. Uh, Marty. Marty um, it's obviously incredibly awful because even Marty agrees that he is a monster. It's like, it's hard to tell exactly what he did to her. Although we could probably assume the worst. Like, to most people, and I hate to say this, but to most people, the idea of preventing a nuclear war might be a bit more important than stopping the abuse of one woman. Yeah, I see that. So the reason, she says the reason that she waited months. She waited months to make sure that she knew what kind of person Roger was. And, you know, like... Once it got to the once in, during the interview, he just basically said that he would love to have the nuclear codes. He was iffy, but it was hard to tell exactly if he was going to be the kind of person who, well, I've got them now, I'm going to use them, or if he was going to be the kind of guy who would wait for somebody else to provoke him to use them. So that's what it feels like to me is that she waited this time not only to see if A, he would actually win but also be if he would actually get access to the nuclear codes and to also suss out exactly what kind of person he was to see if he would actually use them. And I see two hands up. So okay. go ahead. Whoever. I just want to say uh, the uh, plot here with uh, Roger and, you know, the, the thing, more than one person has uh, compared it to a little Stephen King novel called The Dead Zone. I don't remember that one. Psychics. Uh, it's, like, it's basically a guy gets in the car. You know how little that narrows it down, Kajiri? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, I'll just give a quick summary. Guy gets in the car crash, goes in the coma for four years. He wakes up. He's got psychic abilities. Whatever he, Whenever he touches someone, he can see like something about their future or their past or whatever. And in the final act, he touches this politician who's running called Greg Stilson. And it's like, oh, shit, if this guy becomes the president, we're going to go to nuclear war. And so he has to uh, take care of that. Ah. So it's a simple thing, but Ruby doesn't do anything quite as drastic as what happens in the climax of that book. She just very cleverly uses her own loneliness against Roger. But, uh, but while, I'm here, while I'm here for it, like, it, it's, it's fucked up that in the scene where she walks out on the pitch, they were going to shoot her for walking out on the pitch. No, hey. that makes sense, because they didn't know what she was doing. Keep off the grass. Anyway. Not, uh, even, not only keep off the grass, but also the fact she had her cell phone up and was doing something to Roger, and they don't know what she was doing. So, anyways, go ahead, Kachiri. Sorry. Anyway, uh, Roger definitely seems like a guy that you know, he says, oh, gain the nuclear codes is to uh, help defend the country. But he would have an entire army sit on a border just staring at the other country until the other country did something to be like, oh, hey, they did something first. Nukes! Yeah, I think essentially he, she was waiting to see if he was going to be active or reactive. 
Pun intended. More mostly. Oh God. Yeah. I appreciate the pun. Um <laughs> the the scene where she does walk across the, the grass. I think it's, it's perfectly summing up of 73 yards and this divisive nature of it, because uh, on the one hand, it makes no goddamn sense at all that people can't walk on the grass until a certain day. Uh, the fact that they were going to shoot her for just stepping across the football pitch, but the way it's filmed is brilliant and the, and the tension ramps up superbly well, you know, like, and she's got like, the, the, the yard counter, it's telling her 60 yards, 61 yards, etc., etc., etc. And then just as she's about, she said, one more step and I'll shoot. She said, that's exactly where I need to be. And then the woman appears from uh, to the side of Roger. And she leans in and she says to him, don't forget to subscribe to the official Doctor YouTube channel. He runs away screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, it is quite obvious that what she's actually saying is, I'm here about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would have been awkward? As if the woman showed up 73 yards uh, behind her. I mean, 20, <laughs> 28 inches behind her. <laughs> uh, we, we should have brought this up sooner as well, but um, another Susan Twist appearance. I'm getting fed up with this now. Thank you. I, I just, I just want to add that what the woman really whispered to Roger was, i back to the 11th hour by Lena McTeer. <laughs> That's one less plug we got to do at the end of the episode. Thanks, Frez. <laughs> or we could do more plugs. Who knows? I'll plug it again. Uh, I don't mind. We're gonna, so before we're, we move on, I have I have two last things plugs. to say. Let it talk, Kachiri. God. <laughs> <laughs> I I have just two last things to say. The first is quite obviously y'all have never seen like Kachiri. Most likely, but uh, Frez and Rainey probably haven't ever seen like people actually protect politicians here in this country. Like, I was not surprised by the fact that they just started like pulling out guns and shit, uh, because Ruby was doing something weird on the grass in front of their new prime minister. Well, just yeah, saying. you're American, exactly. Um, and the second thing that I now have to try to remember because it slipped my mind now, shit, what was it? It was something that Kachiri said, and I can't remember what it was now. Uh, something about the woman teleporting? No. Um, something about follow the Common Rider Reviews YouTube channel? <laughs> Speaking of plugs. <laughs> hey, that's one that's probably to the end of the episode. Great. Well, thank you, Kachiri. <laughs> yeah, I brought Common you know, I'll, I'll think of it. I'll think of it later. It was something that I wanted to uh mentioned real fast but now i can't remember what it was so something I'll, about I'll it out. something about 219 feet and not in the weird way no you are running this into the ground my dude but um yeah susan twist either. susan twist makes another appearance quite cl uh, close to the start of the episode actually she's playing a hiker but crucially this time ruby recognizes her yeah, it's like that thing you said that was going to happen. So this is not just a troll. This is actually going to play into th events. Speaking or of is it? Speaking I of mean, trolls. Look, look at the episode you're saying this in. No, but also, why, why specifically mention, don't I know you? Speaking, Go ahead. Speaking of trolls, did you hear what uh, Davis and Moffat said on the Doctor Who uh, podcast that RTD's been doing? For these episodes? Uh, Are you talking about Pertwee's Burgers? No. Well, maybe. <laughs> close. Uh, but Davis and Moffat was like, oh, yeah, we, we, we ran into a bit of an issue uh, when we got ready to start filming. We were missing uh, an actor in uh, every single uh, episode. And, you know, we took, we, we, you know, sent out the thing to try and find someone. And luckily enough, there was an actress 66.75 meters out the window. And I was like, Oh crap! That's a good idea. Um, <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> so I remembered uh, what I was going to say. Okay, cat, go ahead. So, um, remember how you guys were talking about how Ruby thought that um, doing this was going to resolve the entire thing? Yeah. 
it made me remember um, when Ruby was meeting with Kate, Kate specifically said something about how as humans, we always want to assign rules to things. And I was just thinking, that was a pretty sweet Moffat bird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. All right. All right. I'll let you have that one. They are very good friends. So I could absolutely see him doing a burn like that. This is I'm hilarious intrigued. to me that it's right after the Moffat episode too. Well, Since we'll I'm see... up with burgers, sorry, Kachira, go ahead. I was going to say I'd love to see Moffat uh, give R two D. Oh no, wait, I guess Moffat did uh, do an R two D bash back in uh, the the Smith era a few times. Like he made a comment about Rose, and he made a comment about uh, Tenet, uh, basically making fun of R two D's rant back then. So I guess this would be R two D's. Uh, Revenge, you know, a decade later. Then Chibnall made a Moffat dash by going, What? Missy who? No, this is the evil master who's a cackling madman <laughs> like John Sim. Remember to that? Fact, that master was still great, but yes. I'm pretty sure Chibnall was bashing the entirety of Doctor Who with his entire series. Ch yeah. Chibnall was an insult to Ch uh, Doctor Who for just being alive. Oh, wow. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, okay. <laughs> I would. <laughs> oh my god but um the thing yeah, I, was I... Gonna, I was gonna bring up now now i've forgotten what it was hang on oh pertwee's burgers yeah so um burgers? You really was, it jo was it josh snares did this video yes yes yeah yes. so shout out to josh snares but uh it turns out that this is actually true that he did have a burger van but he had it after he left doctor who but it didn't stop Stephen uh russell t davis coming up with a fantastic joke that just cracked Stephen moffat up into a thousand pieces so, like, imagine, imagine you were flying the wall. You were flying the wall at Doctor Who uh, head headquarters. Like, um, Patrick Trance just left the show, and you think, "What about that guy that runs the burger van down the street? He'll be perfect for the Doctor." <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen Moffat just corpses. It's just wonderful. Oh, it's great. It's a, it's it's really funny hearing those two talk about Doctor Who because they are. Big fans of all eras of Doctor Who, regardless of what some naysayers say. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, Doctor Who is so wild. God, I got my cup, bro. Um, I can't believe that voice is so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're in the room with us right now. <laughs> get out of the damn room. You're not welcome here. <laughs> no, but it's just, it's refreshing because, like, Every time I heard Chibnall talk about his era, it was like so boring and uninterested. Like he did not want that job at all. Remember when it they like was... did a remember when they like did a fifteen minute video where he had to explain flux? Yeah. Like honestly, I will say of all the people in the behind the scenes for uh his era that actually looked like they gave a shit, it was Jody Whitaker. Oh, yeah. it, it it sucks because she really wanted to be the doctor, but she did not have a team that cared. Hey, hey Chibnall. Yeah, hey, Chibnall. Where's, where's my 15-minute uh, explanation video on where the fuck the rest of the universe is? <laughs> hey, hey, Boeing, I heard uh, Chris Chibnall is a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> Really, Kachiri? Oh, God damn it, that rhymes as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a poet. Day day we turn Rainiac into a corpse by corpsing. I'm a, I'm a poet. I didn't even realize it. Uh, hey. Hey. Uh, anyway, the, the, the big reveal is that, yeah, okay, so... Well, I said the big reveal. We don't actually know who the woman was. We know at the end that oh, Ruby changes places with her to to uh, warn the Doctor and Ruby not to step on the on the fairy circle. But I I think now I've got a different perspective on this. I don't think what she says to people is the important thing. I think it's their reaction is the important thing. Hmm. I don't think you have to know what she said to them individually. Just that whatever it was, it was sufficient to elicit that kind of a reaction. So it must be terrible. Mm -hmm. We don't actually have to know what she actually said to them. It doesn't have to be, um, oh, you you will die in seven days, or um, your mother never loved you, or here's the perfect recipe for pineapple upside down cake. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? <laughs> you you want to know what she said? You want to know what's... 
Bowie knows you're a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was the whistleblower, though? Carl Cates or the, or the Welsh guy? All of them. All of them. Okay. <laughs> right. What really confuses me about this whole thing, though, like, um, if we were to take into the idea that Ruby is the old woman the entire time and she's, I don't know, just talking to her younger self, um, why does that elicit such a visceral reaction from literally everybody? And even if, like, even if what she's saying is inconsequential, like, what it what are these people seeing that causes the exact same reaction? Because like, obviously when Kate tries to take the picture of the old woman, they can't see anything. It's just like a blurry image and everything. Are they seeing that? Are they seeing like, because they, they wouldn't recognize Ruby as an old woman. They haven't seen that at all. So how do they, you know, like why do they have this horrible reaction is, is what I'm wondering. Why don't you just say that? I have a theory. So I think this uh, old woman is uh, death. Um, always. <laughs> I mean, then, wait though, a that's second. Still, still, um, <laughs> that's still something that you wouldn't recognize right away. That would be more of a internal reaction than anything. So um, the, realistically, the only... we could say that anything the old woman says and does doesn't really matter. It's who she is that matters. I mean, if Gain within like earshot of it, gain that close to death. I, again, like in real life, if you ever found out that you are inches away from death in any way, shape, or form, like, oh, hey, that snake has the wrong uh, rhyme to it. I'm dead, Jack. You know, better step away from that snake. You know, you're going to run, you're going to freak out. I mean, someone pulls out a gun, you're not going to stay close to that gun, you're going to run away from it. It's not even that they're running away, though. They get angry. Like, Ruby's mom, um, Cherry Sunday, she is pissed off when she's in that taxi. Kate gets pissed off when she's, you know, like, listening to what the words are saying. Because she doesn't see the woman. We have to remember that. She doesn't actually see the woman. She hears whatever the woman's saying. And whatever she's saying is giving that reaction, not just of fear, but of pure anger, too. Absolute disgust. I've just realized that um, if your first exposure to Kate Stewart was um, the Disney series, my God, you think this one was terrible? Very mm -hmm. terrible. I mean, the second Kate showed up, I was uh, sitting on the couch with my roommate watching it. I threw both my arms up like, Kate! And then this happened, I'm like, oh. Which my, my roommates only ever dealt with Kate with the giggle in this episode. My roommate, like, made it to uh, Clara and was like, nah, I, you know, one of my many, many people I've met in the last, like, five years that stopped watching Doctor Who at uh, Fresno's Best Girl. Um, How dare they? <laughs> and, like, my, room, my my roommate was just having a blast for this episode, too. Like, the Miss Flood scene. We haven't talked about Miss Flood's back. You know, that other weird fourth wall breaking mystery. Well, I mean, that that, that's so that's so minor that... She's literally like, oh, nothing to do with me. I'm going back inside. Yeah. No, no. Like, <laughs> my, my roommate was like, well, the whole thing has nothing to do with you. And then, like, two seconds later, oh, it has nothing to do with me. And my roommate was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> now, what, what it was was this. It was that um, Anita... <laughs> Didn't it Dobson? But the actress came out and realized, oh no, I'm, I'm not in this, I'm not in this scene for another three episodes. Whoops. Oh god. <laughs> I, uh, I think we'll see Mrs. Flood again towards the finale, but um You can't so, yeah. do, do you want to know something that I just found out? Hmm. Is it spoilery? Not really. Um your mileage may vary. Okay, go ahead. She's been confirmed to be appearing in the finale. I don't think that's a spoiler because. Well, yeah, I don't know. I want to be careful, and uh, she's obviously in the next episode as well. Wait, floods in the next episode? Are you, are you talking about Anita Dobson or Susan Twist? Susan Twist. I thought we were talking about uh -oh. Susan Twist. We're talking about Mrs. Flood. Dobson. Yeah, Mrs. Flood. Mrs. Flood is Anita Dobson. I don't remember Susan Mrs. Flood. Twist and Susan Twist, like that. Um, have you seen a Tales before, love? That's Mrs. That's Mrs. Flood. 
Oh. The neighbor. Lady at the end of Ruby Road. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Susan Twist is the name of the actress. Yeah. We don't know the name of the character in the finale because um, she plays a different character every time. And she'll probably be in, in the mm -hmm. one that's on next week as well. And the one after that. The one after that. Uh, God, we'll never we'll okay. be rid of this actress. I can't wait for uh, Gawa to step on a bug to create the next episode. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. I, I got really distracted because I literally just saw that tweet, and I thought we were still talking about Susan Twist. No, we're talking about um, Mrs. Flood, but she's barely in this. Blink you'd miss her. You've never seen a TARDIS before, have you? I just... Let's move on. So, ultimately, I, I don't think... We know for a fact that there will be no... Russell T. Davis said he, he's never going to reveal what the woman said to people. He's never going to do that. Good. I think it's better that way. And I'm going to make it a, 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 might be a certain strange analogy, but um, I'm going to refer to the world of rock music and Queen. Yeah. For some, the greatest band that ever lived. Their biggest hit, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. If you've ever listened to Bohemian Rhapsody and you pay attention to the lyrics, they're nonsense. They don't really have any. Well, that's that's not really fair. Some people have come up with a with a accepted theory that the song is about somebody on death row. I mean, Mama just killed a man. But we can't say that for certain because the band members will never tell. And also, uh, Seal will never explain what "Kiss from a Rose" is about. <laughs> that's another good example. And, and, and we'll never know who looked. Hotel the dog California. Out. And and That's also, not a good example, Kachiri, but I appreciate the effort. <laughs> and, and also, I want to add, go watch Freddie Mercury's Live Aid performance after this podcast. Oh, because, God. Because that is probably one of the best uh, Queen performances ever. Ew. Uh, I, get, I get what you mean. Nobody knows for sure, definitively, what the hell is going on in the Bohemian yeah, we, we can guess, we can speculate, but we won't know officially what it, that song is about. Because the people that know what it's about are never telling us. And you know what? That's fine. Absolutely. I literally wrote an essay about it in school. and got really, really good marks for it. So I, I will. I will say, you know, the, you know going back to David Lynch, uh, I mentioned this in my, when I wrote about the episode. That uh, whenever an actor would come to him and be like, uh, "Yeah, so can you give me a little guidance on what's going on here in this scene so I can play it better." He'd just say, well, what do you think? And that's that's the, that's the lens you should take it with. What do you think? Do you think it's a metaphor for anxiety and abandonment? Do you think it's the Fae fucking with you? Do you think it's death itself? Do you think it's apprehensions about being queer? Do you think it's fucking nuclear analogy? I don't know. What do you think? No, Sasha, what do you think about this episode for us? What did I, um, so you're asking me what I thought of 65,836.8 millimeters? Oh, my God! Because <laughs> I think it's a fucking masterpiece. You, you have basically, you know, posited that several times throughout this podcast. It's something fresh and new and weird that Doctor Who has never really done before. Just a weird, ambiguous, strange, supernatural, folk horror slash fey tinged episode bringing magic into the world. It almost is. It almost defies being classified as a Doctor Who episode because you know it's not a sci-fi show. It's weird shit happens. Could be magic. Could be not. We don't know. Just watch it and vibe with it and see how it makes you feel. And how it made me feel was a. Uh, incredibly unsettled a little depressed extremely curious but all in all very interested with my time so mwah, chef's kiss so in other words a normal saturday night for you <laughs> <laughs> but whether you love this episode or hated it you got to appreciate the variety we're getting in this series i love that I no two actually, episodes have been the same. I was actually about to bring that up. Like, we've literally had, you know, the, a standard sci-fi episode, a musical, a uh, tense war episode, and now horror, and then now we're going to uh, commentary about social 
media and stuff like that. Yeah, funny you should mention that. Um, Kat, do you want to have any last thoughts on uh, on 73 Yards before we get going? Uh, sure. Um, it's a really good episode. Like Fred said, you could probably just interpret whatever you want from it. But honestly, I like the fact that it's not really explained other than, you know, you know it being the Fae. The Fae are fucked up. <laughs> Please don't come after me. You're not, a, you're not invited into my home. You're just not. No, stay away. I thought it was vampires, but yeah. Um, and also, uh, if I suddenly disappear, it's probably because my friend Chris is taking me to go find skinwalkers. So, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. What am I going to do with her? So, um, next week, then. Next week on, on Black Mirror, I mean, Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> we have Dot and Bubble. And the reactions to this trailer, about 20 people immediately compared it to Love of Monsters. And I'm thinking, did those people ever watch Love of Monsters? Because this is not it. This is this is not going to be a, a, a takedown slash love letter to Doctor Who fandom with the poorly thought out monster from a children's competition. No, this, this is going to be uh, The Circle. If, uh, if someone starts humping concrete, we'll know. Oh my God, Kachiri. I want you to know, ever since I showed Chris that episode, she still brings it up. I have traumatized that poor girl. <laughs> and not for the first time. No. So you, we'll you're just sitting that. in the car, and, and she's driving, and she turns to you, and she goes, Cat, no, really, what the fuck was up with the concrete blowjob episode? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She'll just look at me, like, every so often, she'll just say, oh, man, it's, it's a good thing that his girlfriend isn't a concrete slab, and I look over her like, what? What? Excuse me. Uh, I'm going into our chat. Hey, Chris. <laughs> love <laughs> and monsters. Send. Okay. And I'm just going to go into the chat to see whether or not she responds to it before the end of this podcast is over. Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> She's offline, thank God. She's probably still later. around. I can hear her moving around. I'm not going to... Uh, she just comes to the microphone and screams and then runs off again. Uh, Actually, hang on a second. Oh, oh no! Oh, what have you done? Oh, boy. <laughs> Professor no, for, for this podcast. No word for it. What the hell have you done? Oh, no. Now I've broken the fairy circle of at least Chris. Oh, shit. <laughs> Can we not, like, conflate those two things? What? Chris is our favorite Faye. Oh. My God. <laughs> you can't say that about a person, Kajiri. You know I can hear you guys, right? <laughs> I'm trying to stop them teasing her. We're not teasing her. You just said she, she's your favorite Faye, but... That was an insult. I literally walked in and she had this look of disgust on her face. She already had the chat open. <laughs> oh no, I, I just seen a reaction. That's going in the podcast. <laughs> Put it in. Put it in, Ray. Put it in. I mean, that's that's the right reaction too. Uh, but but yet, yeah, the, the important thing about Dot and Bubble or our podcast Dot and Bubble is all being well and, and you know, assuming they can make it as of um as of the time of recording this, the 27th, 27th of May, uh, 2024, we have a guest lined up. <laughs> Excuse me, I call the police. <laughs> we're, we're just live tweeting our chat right now. Continue, what? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Red, please, please. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I literally oh, can't. This is going to be a to edit. <laughs> I can't continue. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> I'm crying. 
I want you to know all that I'm crying right about now. Okay. Uh, tears of tears of, of, of joy because we'll never do better than this. Uh. The Dallas Beach for Dinner Planet, we've picked up the St. Rios podcast. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, oh, speaking of Daleks and Peking, uh, Pip's latest creation. Oh, my God. <laughs> the uh, the deleted ending to the first part of Re 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 <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm really doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, please, please try and compose yourself and finish your thought. Uh, You're saying something with a special guest. Uh, yeah, if if um, if we haven't just scared them away with all this nonsense, uh, we have a guest lined up for the Dumb right. Double podcast. Rain, it's us. Have we ever scared any guest off of this shit? They're just they're just as fucked up and gremlins as we are. You make a good, a good point, and we love them for it. To be clear, Sh shall I wrap this up? Yes. Okay. Rainy, where can you find us, lovely people? About time. You can find us other people on Twitter, including Kateri, who at the, at the time of the recording has not been banned yet. I know, I'm, I'm amazed too. Um, it's it's twitter.com forward slash Rainy Domaniac, forward slash Cognitive Usurper, forward slash Freezing Inferno, forward slash Nick Kateri. He can also be found on threads.com. For Twitch, it's twitch.tv forward slash Rainy Domaniac, forward slash Cognitive Usurper, forward slash Freezing Inferno, and forward slash the Kateri. Mega May. Mega May coming to an end tonight, I believe. Yeah. Oh, and I have one more thing to plug. Uh, Go ahead. I We had uh, Lena McTeer on the podcast two weeks ago for Devil's Court. And I am happy to say I went over to her side of the pond for uh, a round table on the first three episodes of the new series of Doctor Who on her blog, Obsession Procession. So it was me, Lena, her partner, Sophie. And Sean Dillon talking about Space Babies, The Devil's Chord, and boom. Link below if you want to read us uh, mention those episodes again. It was a lot of little discussion. And, and we were all... Of Lena, goodbye, back to the Bye, Lena, Lena Federer, but here. Volumes 1 and 2. You can buy Tower for the Trees by Sean Dillon. You can buy Share of the Gallifreyan, which features, among other great people, Lena and Sean and our own Freezing Inferno. I'm in the book. Hey. He's in the book. Have you read that yet? I mean, I, I was going through a time that year. You were going through a time. But, uh, in some respects, I still am, but I will try to read the book when I can. Yes. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. And Mike is there. Don't read the book. Watch Call the Blade. Watch Call the Blade. I watch the Call of the Blade. I think you got that wrong. Mike, if Mike was here, he'd be saying, play the SNES version of Wizard of Oz. God, fuck. You're right. Mike! Now you're <laughs> There's your powerful response. We always got the whole podcast without having to do that, but Cap ruined it right at the end. I'll get back to streaming yeah. eventually. I've been playing way too much Persona. Well, that's okay. I've been playing fucking Shin Megami Tensei, and that's frying my brains! I've been playing play yeah, nothing. with Chris every single Sunday. It's at 12 p.m. Uh, uh, Mountain Standard Time. Join us. You, you want to talk about negotiating with the Fae? Try negotiating with all those fucking demons. <laughs> and I've been playing nothing because it. adulting is hard. It is. God, it is. There's like so many things I want to get back to, into. We need to do a fall, guys. I can't do it. There's no time. Rain, we need to do a Fall Guys day again. They've changed it so much since last yeah, time. Maybe, maybe do a Fall Guys stream when I've got, you know, some time to actually do a Fall Guys stream. You need to sit down and watch it a new Ryan Gosling movie? No. But no, you yeah. know what movie we do need to watch? We need to watch the Bee Gees uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. We I repeat, no. Do, Kat. We do! I will go yes. through that hell with you. Yes. Name a time and place. Brand, this six point six seven five e plus seven micrometers away from ending this podcast. Uh, Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> That's the that's the, the biggest stretch in stretch Armstrong. Good night, folks, and we'll see you next time with hopefully our special guest joining us for Dot and Bubble.
Until then, bye for now. Good night. Save me.